If you bought a comic book that came out from late 1981 to the beginning or middle of 1982, chances are you saw this advertisement on the back. That's for a movie called Megaforce, which was a 1982 science fiction comedy action movie directed by Hal Needham, who is famous for uh, movies like Smokey and the Bandit and The Cannibal Run. It was written by James Whitaker, Albert S. Ruddy, and rewritten a little bit by Hal Needham. Uh, in the far future of 1990, the country Gamibia, which is fictional, uh, led by the ruthless General Guerrera, attacks its peaceful neighbor, the country Sudan, which is also, in this movie, fictional. Colonel Byrne White and Major Zara look for the representatives of a group called Megaforce, which is a, a nearly invincible high-tech team of international daredevils who fight for justice around the world. Hmm. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? G.I. Joe fans, right? I'm looking at you. Anyway, the whole idea for all of this originates with Bob Catchler who's a writer and producer, he had an idea for a television series about an international team of soldiers who would go out like sort of like a vigilante group and fight battles around the globe, uh, defending the people who couldn't defend themselves. Again, sounds a lot like G.I. Joe, right? Which would explain a lot of the excitement that people my age had with the advertisements that were coming out related to Megaforce. For instance, check out the trailer. From the director who brought you Smokey and the Bandit, Hooper, Cannonball Run, comes the ultimate spectacle. Megaforce, an elite compact fighting unit armed with the most sophisticated weapons ever seen on a movie screen. The mission to preserve freedom and justice and battle the forces of evil. The good guys always win. Even in the 80s. Megaforce. So, like I said, it all starts with the writer Bob Catchler, who is shopping this idea around. Meanwhile, at the same time, Hal Needham, fresh off the success of the Smokey and the Bandit and Cannibal Run movies, is looking to make a G.I. Joe movie, but he couldn't get the rights from Hasbro. He and Catchler hook up and Needham convinces Catchler that it's not a television show that he wants to make, that it's actually a series of movies, and Needham signs on to direct. They end up getting their funding from a Hong Kong movie studio called Golden Harvest, who is looking to break into the Western film market. Golden Harvest had set up a $50 million slate of films. $20 million of it was going to go to Megaforce as the first movie that was released for Golden Harvest in the United States, while the rest of that money went to a movie called The High Road to China, starring Tom Selleck, The Protector, which, honestly, I've never heard of. If any of you out there know it, please let me know. I think it's from 1984. And a little movie that we're very familiar with called Blade Runner. So those were the sort of first four opening shots by Golden Harvest in their attempt to get into the American film market. Uh, I don't know much about High Road to China or The Protector, but Blade Runner was certainly a good idea. And on paper, Megaforce is a pretty good idea too. As far as casting goes, the main leader of the Megaforce group, Ace Hunter, was one of the most important decisions that the director and producers had to make. They found Barry Bostwick, mostly because of a critically lauded performance he was giving on a stage play of Pirates of Penzance in Los Angeles at the time. Now again, at the time, Barry Bostwick was doing a lot of stage stuff, but 
you and I probably know him better as Brad from the Rocky Horror Picture Show way back in 1974. Janet! Ah! Rocker! Janet! Dr. Scott! Janet! The rest of the cast was Michael Beck as Dallas, who actually has a special place in the heart of We Collectors Confessions people here, because he played Swan in The Warriors, which is one of our favorite movies. You also have Paris Kambatha as Zara, who was first noticed by film fans in Star Trek The Motion Picture. That's right, she had the shaved head. Great haircut. Then you have, filling out the rest of the major cast, you have Edward Mulhair, who would later go on to become famous in Knight Rider. He played Byrne White. And Henry Silva, great character actor, played the villainous Guerrera, who would lead his army of tanks to fight against Megaforce. The whole thing was filmed in the desert outside of Las Vegas for about two months in 1981. William Frederick, an engineer and vehicle designer, designed all of the buggies called Mega Destroyers and the motorcycles uh, for the movie, and all of them were working vehicles. It took him eight months to design and construct the vehicles for the movie, and all of them worked. Even the missiles, actually, they weren't real missiles, but they fired off the front of the motorcycles for real and all of it functioned correctly. It was actually a pretty cool engineering feat. The Guerrera's army, which was mostly tanks, that was a bunch of 48 A5 tanks supplied by the 121 Armored Battalion of the Nevada National Guard. The movie, in addition to a few other cool stuff, uh, used a process called introvision. It was the first time this was ever used. Introvision is a technique, a camera technique, that allows actors to walk in and out of photographs so they were able to cut a lot of costs as far as sets go. It actually, for the time, looked pretty good. Except maybe that motorcycle thing at the end. For reference, go back to the beginning of this video. Interestingly enough, there was no costume designer on the film. All of the costumes were designed by people working at the Mattel Toy Corporation. So yeah, all those gold Lycra spandex outfits were designed by guys who normally design action figures. It's not that hard to tell, huh? We already mentioned the comic book ads that seemed to be on the back of every single comic book in 1981 and 1982. Along with that, there was a tremendous marketing blitz. Uh, if you're interested in collecting posters, I urge you to go online and look at all of the different posters that were released for Megaforce. There's a ton of them, and a lot of them are pretty cool. Uh, the movie was finally released on June 25th, 1982, and before the movie even hit theaters, there was already a sequel in the works. It was going to be called Deeds Not Words, probably Megaforce 2, Deeds Not Words, and it, the shooting was supposed to start in September of 1982, just two months after the film was released. Unfortunately, Megaforce was a bomb. It was an absolute box office failure. Critics hated it. Word of mouth absolutely killed it. And there's a, probably a few different reasons for that, which I'll get into in just a bit. Uh, so yeah, box office bomb. It only made a little over $5.5 million against its $20 million budget in theaters. Well, why? Well, probably because there's a lot of tonal confusion in the movie. You watch it, and you're not sure if you're watching a comedy, some kind of parody. Is this a science fiction action film? We don't know. In response to the box office bomb, all the sequels were canceled, and Megaforce petered out. It did really well, actually, on VHS, uh, probably because of kids like me who didn't go to see it in theaters, but were excited to watch it eventually and watched it on video. And it was a big time hit in heavy rotation on late night cable through the 80s and into the early 90s, along with movies like Beastmaster and Highlander and other sort of cult hits from the 1980s. Um, it has some very famous fans, actually, out there. In particular, Trey Parker and Matt Stone happened to be very big fans of Megaforce and used it as one of the inspirations for their Team America World Police comedy. So, for a science fiction movie released in the 1980s, you would think there's tons of collectibles out there, right? Tons of action figures and t-shirts and all that other stuff. Turns out, no. 
uh, there actually are no action figures produced for this movie, which seems crazy since it kind of started its life as sort of an alternate G.I. Joe story. So you figure right away they'd be making action figures. They did not. The, there was a close association with the Mattel Toy Company, and they released a bunch of Hot Wheels collectibles. So there were two different versions of the Mega Destroyer, which were the sort of dune buggy tank things they had. And one was orange and white, the other was black. They also sold a personnel carrier with a white interior and white bike on the back. And there was a variant of that with a chrome interior and a chrome bike on the back. Then you had the TACCOM, which was a tactical command vehicle, kind of like a, look like, like a large transport vehicle of some kind. Uh, you had a battle tank, so obviously you could have Guerrera's army going against them. There was a Hot Wheels racetrack playset that was released. They designed the Mega Fighter flying motorcycle, but never produced it. Which is really weird, considering that that scene where Ace flies into the back of the airplane at the end of the movie, that was a pretty famous scene and kind of one of the selling points. I know I wanted one of those motorcycles that shot rockets and had machine guns on the front. And that's it. Well, not quite. And considering that one of the big advertising pushes for this movie was on the back of every comic book in 1982, there was no comic tie-in for Megaforce. There are no Megaforce comic books. Not that I could find, anyway. That's not everything, though. There was an Atari 2600 game released. And, apparently, a lot of people liked it. It was a side-scrolling shooter where you played one of the characters of Megaforce driving on the motorcycle, and if you raised the motorcycle above the horizon line, it would fly. Unfortunately, when it was flying, it ran out of gas faster, so you had to get back on the ground to refuel. But still, apparently, by all means, it was a fun game. Look at this review from 8bitcentral.com. A surprisingly fun game with some interesting dynamics. It's visually pleasing with good sound and gameplay. We like shooting at things, and Megaforce does it well. Yes, yes, they did shoot. They did do it well. There was one other thing I found online that could be considered a collectible. One of the Mega Destroyers, one of the dune buggy tank thingies that was made for the movie, was on sale on eBay at one time for $10,000. It was one of two production-used vehicles that actually survived the filming and scrapping process that followed the movie. Uh, I didn't double-check to see if it's still out there, but if you're interested, go on eBay. Look for it. You got ten grand, you can get yourself a Mega Destroyer. Might be fun to drive around on the freeways. So, that's it. That was all about Megaforce. Not a lot of collectibles. There's some Hot Wheels stuff out there, even though it's a cult film. And I'm surprised that no one's actually kind of gone back to this. Like, you know, NECA does those early 80s figures for cult films. Nobody's really gone back and done anything for Megaforce. The China just kind of sits there. Even though people love this movie as one of the so bad it's great uh, movies to watch. One of the things that's disappointing about Megaforce is there are so many paths in the multiverse it could have taken that could have made it really something good. If they had finally figured out, maybe during filming, some sort of definitive tonal path to take, make it an action film, make it a comedy, make it a straight sci-fi film, find something that would kind of unify it into one thing, then maybe it would have gotten a little more popularity and could have gotten more of it. Um, if it had stayed a TV show, that would have been pretty interesting because it would have been up there with things like Airwolf and Knight Rider and other shows that centered around vehicle-style action. So we got kind of cheated out of that stuff. I like to think about the movie as a kind of could have been. We could have had a completely alternate G.I. Joe running alongside. And if they had been smart enough to make action figures in the three and three quarter size with the swivel elbows, these characters could have easily have joined forces with G.I. Joe at any time and enhanced the play of both lines. So that's it. Tell me what you think. Did you watch Megaforce? Did you like it? Were you as disappointed as I am that it wasn't more of a big franchise? Let us know in the comments. And while you're at it, like, subscribe, uh, drop us a tip, join us here on YouTube, or go and check us out on Patreon. Until then, collect what you love and love what you collect. See you next time.